I want you to just take a second and think about the victories you've had in your practice. And as public defenders, I think we all know, we sometimes have to redefine victories. Sometimes victories don't mean you're not guilty. Sometimes victories mean a good resolution or uh, the jury finding a lesser. But just take a minute and think about the victories you've had. Because I think when you do that, you'll find that many of those victories, maybe even most, have to do with investigation. Now, I'm sure all of you could raise your hand and say, no, 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 you know, I had this case where I won a suppression motion or I found, you know, the one case that was precisely on point and that's why I won. We probably all have had that experience. But many of our cases, many of the great results that we get for our clients have to do with investigation. And the reason is because our cases largely have to do with facts. The law is often not on our side. And so the facts we get from the prosecutor in discovery, those facts are not in our favor. That's why they're giving them to us. Those are the facts that support the charges against us. And investigation is a creation of facts. Facts create your theory of the case. Facts support your theory of the case. By the same token, facts also limit your theory. I think we've all probably had the experience where we're investigating. We have an idea of what our most compelling defense theory is, and then it gets extinguished by investigation. But ultimately, investigation is the core of a successful and meaningful defense for our clients because that is our opportunity to get out there and create facts that may actually be useful for our clients and give us the opportunity to prevail in the case. So we're going to do a couple things this morning. The first thing we're going to do is just talk a little bit about basic concepts of case theory, which I think everybody's probably familiar with. But that uh, is a focus that needs to be applied to investigation as well. This is the baseline. Don't trust anything in discovery. Don't trust it. Because the reason it's there is because it's not helpful for you. The reason why the state turned it over is because they think that supports your client being convicted of a particular crime. So in our practice and in investigation, a baseline approach needs to be having a high degree of skepticism, really not trusting anything that you receive from the state as being true or as having veracity. Now, in the ideal world, whenever you receive your case, you would be able to investigate every single aspect of every single person. You'd do a life history and go back into all the witnesses' background to dig whatever dirt you need to on them. But that isn't possible in every case. That's not even possible for every witness in a single case. So you need some sort of lens through which you're approaching uh, your investigation. And this is the same lens through which you should be approaching your uh, defense as well. Um, you have your theory, you have your legal defense, you have your facts beyond change. And when you put all those things together, you have your defense theory, which is what uh, you're using to uh, move forward. Let's just talk a little bit about theory and the way it plays out in investigation. This is from Posner and Dodd. Theories just they describe it as the words you hear in your mind as the case is prepared. This is just essentially a, like a colloquial expression of what your defense is in the case. It's highly factually driven. It's got to be persuasive. It's not something that you need to craft at the beginning. But you know, in a self-defense case, it would be something like, I had to protect myself. I didn't have any choice. Or if it's um, maybe not the strongest case or a mis-ID case, you know, that the witnesses didn't see what they think they saw an alibi case that I wasn't there. But in any event, the theory is the unifying focal point of all aspects of your case. It starts with investigation, and that leads to your motions in limine, and your opening, and your cross, and your jury instructions, and everything that follows. So it provides a lens. And that's something that needs to start uh, with investigation. And then the defense is uh, connected to that. That's the legal reason, or the hook uh, that allows the jury to get the result that you want, having your client be found not guilty. And so, you know, obviously the defenses we all know, these aren't all of them, but um, you have your basic legal defenses, 
But the theory, the colloquial expression, needs to actually be tied to a legal defense. Otherwise, you're not necessarily going to be able to present it in court. And so those two things need to operate together when you're starting your investigation to provide you some focus. And then you have facts beyond change. We all know the facts beyond change, the immovable object, facts that are going to be believed by the jury to be true. And they could be anything. They could be photos. They could be videos. They could be potential witnesses or documents. It's important to recognize facts beyond change don't have to be bad. They could be positive or they could be neutral. But here's the most important part about facts beyond change when it comes to investigation. Not that, not that litigation can change it because that's true, but that you can't know what the facts beyond change are until you actually investigate. You could read police reports, you read your discovery and say, wow, that looks really bad. That witness, you know, they said they saw exactly what happened. They said exactly where they were standing. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to be able to get around this witness. But unless you actually investigate, unless you actually do uh, the work to find out about that witness's credibility, to interview them, to find out about their background, you can't actually know whether that is a fact beyond change or not. And when you're coming up with what your theory and your legal defense are, or your defense theory, it needs to be either built in harmony with or upon the facts beyond change, but only after you truly establish through investigation what the facts beyond change are. So, and this is just kind of by way of introduction, you, you review the discovery, you need to know what the state's saying. I'm not saying be dismissive of that. You need to talk to your client, you need to figure out what the legal defense is, what the hook is that you can get the information admitted. Ideally, there's an emotional component. And then you need to investigate. I absolutely agree with what Bob said about triage is a dirty word. But there also is some reality to the fact that we can't do everything in every case. But one of the things that's really important in investigation that I think sometimes gets uh, the short end of the stick is knowing the where. Whenever you can in your cases as a baseline of investigation, you need to actually go out and see where the thing happened. You need to go to the scene or have your investigator go to the scene. And there are a number of reasons. And you know, it's not in, if there's a DUI that's on a highway, you know, it might not be necessarily that there, you think there are going to be a bunch of witnesses who you need to canvas for because it's a middle, in the middle of some stretch of I-5. But you actually don't know until you go up there. And I you know, recently, a couple years ago now, had a homicide case where the detectives had their three or four witnesses. They hadn't really done any canvas. Um, or they, I guess their version of a canvas was going to um, uh, one building and leaving their business card with the manager in the lobby and saying, hey, if anybody saw anything, you know, give us a call. But <clears throat> Without having gone to the scene, we wouldn't have known that there actually was like a 12-story apartment building right across the street from where this shooting happened. And ultimately, when we canvassed it, we couldn't find any witnesses who saw anything about what happened. But it did definitely give us an opportunity to uh, interview and cross-examine the police officers about the fact that they were out there that night, and there's a 12-story apartment building right across the street, and they didn't do it either. And that's actually their job. So you can't know really uh, what is out there, both positive and negatively, unless you go out to the scene. You need to canvas for witnesses. Obviously, in some cases, there might be surveillance or uh, cameras. And I'm not talking just directly where the incident happens, but you have to look around the surrounding area. You know, walk the sidewalk where it happens, look into the local businesses. It's also really important because it is going to inform the witness interviews you're going to do in the case. You won't know things um, about the physical reality of the place you're talking to people about unless you go out there. And one example is, uh, you know, I have a colleague who had a case. Part of the incident happened outside the Hotel Vintage Park, which is on, um, I think it's on Fifth. It's kind of by the, the Court of Appeals, and. There's a witness on the opposite side of the street from the Hotel Vintage Park. 
And if you didn't go out there at the time of the incident, then uh, you wouldn't know really how hard or easy it is to see across the street. Because if you're on 5th at, you know, 7 o'clock at night, there's really not very much traffic on it. If you're on 5th at 9.30 in the morning, it's clogged with buses for all the lanes and it's basically impossible to see across. You know, that's a, obviously a small example, but there are things about any scene, about any place where an incident happens, whether it's the size of the room or, you know, in terms of smallness or in terms of space. It could be any number of things that would inform your witness interview. So you need to know the where. And you need to know the who, the people who you're talking to. And for this, I'm largely talking about state's witnesses, but you need to be aware of you're putting on defense witnesses. You need to uh, know what the state could raise uh, about them. But you want to obviously find out as much as you possibly can about each witness. Criminal history is the baseline. That's sort of, you know, if you're not doing that, that's, that's a problem. Uh, but it's not just convictions. The PERs we have in the state, the public disclosure requests about arrest records can give you a tremendous amount of information about a person. And so, you know, finding out where a person has lived in this state and in other states, and most other states have some sort of public disclosure uh, mechanism, and getting the arrest history for this person may give you information about their bias, it may give you information about their credibility, it may give you information about stuff you can get in under 404B. So it's not just uh, criminal history in terms of convictions. You want to find out everything you can about their arrest records, about any other sort of filings, you know, protection orders, anti-harassment orders, divorce proceedings, civil proceedings, federal proceedings, especially if they're a cop, you know, and they may have been sued before. Those filings can have a tremendous amount of information um, that may be useful to you. And we'll talk later on about um, something I call traps in witness interviews. We'll talk exactly what I mean by that, but this information that when you're looking at it, initially maybe it doesn't seem like it's automatically admissible, but there may be things you can do in the witness interviews that in fact make it admissible. So that's a great question because it is nice when you have some civilians with juicy stuff that you can really kind of sink into and beat up on, but that's not always the case, right? And so with law enforcement, it's a couple of general things. One is, uh, if you're a cop, you can still get divorced. You know, if you're a cop, you can still get sued for stuff you did while you're being a cop. And so the civil proceedings, divorce proceedings, federal proceedings are something we always want to look at. And then the other thing, and it depends on the situation in the case, but if you have some sort of situation, you know, where you have some sort of low-level drug crime or an obstruction, and it seems like the cop, I promised I was going to keep this clean, it seems like the cop has some sort of a cockamamie reason why they initiated their interaction with your client. Doing a PDR for that officer, because you can do the PDRs just based on names, right? You can do the, any, you know, any police report with this officer name for this time period, and I think you can even do location. We've actually found out a lot of information about, like, wow, this officer seems to have all these consensual social contacts that end with people, you know, emptying their pockets. And so you can find out information about that particular office, officer's practice, potentially, that um, may be useful in terms of bias or their credibility, or also, uh, you know, depending on the race of your client and the dynamics in the case, also stuff like that. So I, I personally, and maybe I just didn't, the, the FOIAs we had when I was an investigator in D.C. were just not uh, as useful um, as the PDRs we have here, Washington State. Although, as attorneys, sometimes the open court stuff is a double-edged sword for us and our clients. Uh, this sort of open disclosure stuff that comes with the PDRs can actually be pretty fantastic for investigation. So PDRs for officers and thinking creatively about you know, what sort of information there might be from their prior contacts with people, uh, I think can be really fruitful. Um, and the internets. The internets is huge. I'm terrible at technology. I got here at like 7.45 to make sure my uh, very basic PowerPoint worked. Um, but I am learning that the, many of the witnesses in our case, and um, law enforcement and not, 
put some pretty interesting stuff up on the internet. And so having uh, either you or your investigator um, trolling for what people are putting up on YouTube and Facebook and Google and Instagram and, and Twitter and all these different things um, can provide a tremendous amount of material. I'll talk about one specific thing in a, in a little while, but I, I co-tried a case with um, one of the attorneys who I supervised, which was a, a bomb threats case. And basically, our, our theory was that the, the client who um, was East African and was uh, alleged to have made this bomb threat at this very like fancy schmancy Capitol Hill gym where it was our theory that he was basically like an undesirable person in that gym. They didn't like him. They assumed he was a Muslim terrorist. And so like everything he said was viewed through that lens. And as it turned out, when we uh, started looking at the complainant's Instagram account, there wasn't something that was directly on point, but she had posted a couple of videos of her doing things that looked um, like there was a component of racial bias to it. She was on the, there's one video of her uh, on a bus, and there was a, a, I think a South Asian woman sleeping next to her. Just like a, you know, middle-aged woman sleeping next to somebody on a Greyhound, like not this weird, crazy thing. And the, com and the uh, complainant took a video of, you know, took a video of herself, like just making all these faces at her and sort of like looking generally disgusted. And so, um, you never know what you're going to find on uh, these social media sites, but this is huge for state witnesses, and quite frankly, it's also huge for your own witnesses and your own clients to know uh, what's out there as well. With law enforcement, um, you know, police policies and procedures manual, I myself, to be quite honest, haven't had a whole lot of luck using those to great effect, but I think they're still important to do. Um, and if you have any sort of witness who um, is an expert, and this is a whole other subject, but the writing that that witness may be relying on or may have written is crucial. So before you actually uh, are going into the witness interview, making sure you're having as much as you can this body of knowledge about who you're talking to on that particular day. And then knowing the what. Uh, the more I do uh, law, the more I recognize that I think success probably comes from acknowledging what you don't know and being humble and acknowledging that you need to learn stuff from other people. And so when you're dealing with a case, being uh, humble and having humility about subject matter that, oh yeah, you know, I think I have like a passing understanding of the you know, cross-racial ID thing, because I did a case on that like eight years ago, but I don't really know what the state of the science is now, and I don't really know um, what around the country people are doing on jury instructions. So uh, in your particular cases, being honest with yourself enough to recognize a subject matter in the, in the case that's important to the case, and making sure you have the support you need. And that may mean, um, before you interview people, getting an expert, and this isn't necessarily an expert to testify, but an expert to educate you on the subject matter so you know uh, what the right questions to ask are. You know, maybe you're challenging the cause of death, or maybe it's some you know, specific crime scene thing, like drop off or blood spatter. Maybe it's something like an identification issue, whatever it is. But again, recognizing when there's a subject matter that you need to be educated in before you can do a meaningful witness interview. And then let's talk a little bit about witness interviews. So um, as I said at the beginning, you need to have a lens through which to see this. You need to have a theory in mind. Uh, you need to marshal everything you've learned about uh, you know, the who, the where, and the what. What you've learned from the scene, what you've learned about the witness who you're interviewing, what you know about the subject matter. Also what you expect the other witnesses to say, and whether you, at least at the beginning of the interview, are assuming this is a witness who you, even though a witness or that is being called by the state, whether you're planning on using them to support your theory or whether you're trying to discredit them. You need to think about whether you're going to try to trap or misdirect the witness in some way, and we'll talk exactly what I mean by that. It's not a bad thing or an unethical thing. Um, you have to be careful and make sure you're adjusting your language accordingly. You want to use very neutral language. You don't want to talk about the crime or the assault or the uh, defendant. 
And like I said, you want to consider how this witness, what they potentially have to say, is going to interact with everybody else and all the other physical evidence. The other thing that I think is really important is to make a conscious decision about whether you're going to do notes or not. And for me, I've gone through sort of a bit of a, a back and forth on this. When I was an investigator in DC, DC uses uh, basically the federal rules of discovery, which from what I understand is nothing. You know, we got nothing. We got like two redacted police reports. They wouldn't tell us who the witnesses were. The witnesses didn't have to talk to us. We would have to figure out who they were, go to their houses, knock on the door, and we had, you know, a, maybe 45 seconds to convince them to let us inside so we could uh, get a statement from them. And so what that means is that if I went to the door with, you know, my meticulously typed out notes, I would have accomplished precisely zero witness interviews because while I was, you know, leafing through the notes, the person would have been like, I'm not talking to this guy. Forget this and slam the door in my face. So you would prepare, you wouldn't have any notes, it'd all be held in your head and it'd be very much on the fly. Here, at least in King County, um, and as I'm talking, you know, feel free to chime in, people especially from other jurisdictions or King County, let me know whether it's different there. But here in King County, the discovery we have, at least as compared with DC, is pretty amazing. We get to interview every single witness. If you want to interview a witness, you will get to interview that witness. It doesn't matter if it's a cop or the medical examiner or, you know, the complainant in a rape case, you will interview everybody. In Two and a half years of being an investigator in DC, I think I interviewed one police officer. Because every time I asked, they were like, uh, in less polite language, said, no, thank you. Here, you get to sit down and essentially depose them, right? It's not necessarily under oath, but uh, it oftentimes can be recorded and you get as much as you want. You get as much time as you want. Uh, and so what that meant for me is I went, when I started practicing here, went through this pretty big change where I'd go in and I'd have like 10 pages of notes and I'd just be like, okay, here's my next question, and here's my next question, and here's my next question. Um, and there's some utility, utility to that here, but there's also something that's lost as well. I think you lose a lot of the rapport you have with the person um, if, you're, if you're stuck in your notes. But you know, you, for your particular practice and your particular learning style, need to figure out which one works better because you wanna make sure you cover all the information because we do have such an amazing opportunity to interview people, but you also want to make sure you're getting the most out of the interview. So make a conscious decision, are you using notes or not? You don't need to look like you're trying to get on The Bachelor or some TV show like that, but there are uh, certain techniques you should keep in mind when you're interviewing. Rapport building. And again, this goes back to my sort of frame of reference, which is DC versus here. DC, you had to be pretty big on rapport building because you needed to get in the door. The person could slam the door in your face and it wasn't like you could go back to the judge and be like, judge, they wouldn't talk to me. And the judge in DC would say, they don't have to. You can see their grand jury testimony uh, during their direct, enjoy. Um, so when I came here, I think over time, I sort of started moving away from consciously trying to build rapport with people because you don't have to as much. I think that's the wrong thing, though. You don't have to uh, belabor rapport building. It can't be false. You know, many times, at least in King County, on, with certain types of witnesses, you're in the prosecutor's office, so you don't, um, you know, want to spend time talking about their dog or their kids or whatever. That's going to potentially strike a false note. But keep in mind, you are a human being talking to another human being, and there's some basic level of rapport building that can be had. It, I, I think if you keep that uh, relationship in mind. In your witness interviews, you want to be conscious how you appear. And so that can mean a lot of things, and I think it also varies um, differently depending on you know, your age and your gender uh, and your race. And so I can only really talk about it from my frame of reference, but when I started working, I used to look like a young person. You know, I used to like, I used to, people used to say like, are you old enough to be a lawyer? And I haven't heard that in a long time, <laughs> um, which, is, which is too bad. But, but one of the things I would always be conscious of in my witness interviews is to uh, accentuate that. And I don't mean like wearing like a Bart Simpson t-shirt and flip-flops, but you know, I would dress comfortably, 
um, you know, in jeans and a t-shirt or, or something. And part of the reason is uh, when you're, I, I think when you're dealing with witnesses, if you're in there and you're in a suit and you, again, are recognizing who you are in relation to them, they're looking at you, you know, whether they like you or dislike you, you are a lawyer. They are most of the time not. There is some power imbalance there. So to, to the degree that you are, you know, you're dressing down, but you're being neat and appropriate and professional, I think that can be sort of a subconscious way to build rapport. The other thing that I sometimes find uh, that I like is it gets people to let their guard down. And so when I'm uh, going to really slam them on cross, it, they get a little surprised when I come in and I'm in my suit and I look all professional. And it's like, oh, wait, I thought we were friends in the witness interview. <laughs> No, 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 we're not friends, but you kind of thought that because I was wearing a t-shirt. So be conscious of how you appear. It's going to be different for everybody, but, uh, and I don't think there's like one right answer on how to appear. I think you could carry off successful witness interviews dressed very professionally if that's kind of how you roll, but uh, keep it in mind. I always make sure to tell the witness up front. You know, obviously who you are, who you work for, all that kind of stuff but that you're going to be asking them some questions. Please, please, please. In the course of me asking, these, me asking you these questions, if there's anything that you're unclear about, if there's anything you're not sure about, just let me know. I'll try to clear it up for you. Why do you do that? Well, it, it is rapport building. What it really is is, aside from rapport building, you are laying the basis for a successful cross-examination when they say, like, oh, I didn't know what you were saying, or, oh, you know, you tried to trick me with this, that, or the other thing. So you want to make sure up front that you are, you know, you, you may have to say in the course of the witness interview, I can't answer that question. There are some ethical obligations I have, so I, I can't actually answer that. But in terms of the question I am asking you, if you don't understand, please let me know. You always want to end the interview with an affirmation that what they said is true, accurate, and complete. And again, um, that doesn't have necessarily a rapport building effect, but in terms of cross-examination and really shoring up that interview to be used for impeachment, um, that can be useful. Wait, how do you do that? What, what does that sound like? I just say at the end of, at the end of a witness interview, um, you know, check with my colleague or the investigator, see if anybody has any more questions. Um, I may well even say to the person, you know, ma'am, is there anything uh, about this incident that you think is important at all that we haven't talked about? No? Is, it, is there anything else you wanted to tell us about anything about what we've been talking about this afternoon? No. Every, is everything we talked about true, accurate, and complete? All right. Thanks. Have a good day. You know, just leave it like that. So when they come in on cross and they try to say, like, oh, you know, you didn't give me the opportunity to say this, or I want to add some... Uh, damning detail, you have this in there. Open-ended questions. I know we're lawyers, we like to be in control, all that kind of stuff. Interviews are about open-ended questions. You'll get plenty of chance to cross later, not in the interview. Have a theory in mind when you go in, have that lens, but be flexible. I can't emphasize that enough. And I had a very specific incident when I was an investigator that kind of drove that home for me. I was investigating a uh, armed carjacking case right kind of down the street from Howard University in DC. Uh, the young woman who got carjacked was a student at Howard. I went out to her house. I remember it was kind of late at night. I wouldn't say late at night. It was dark. She lived with her family out in Maryland somewhere. And the lawyers had said, you know, our theory is Miss ID on this case. You know, she maybe was focusing on the gun or it was dark or it was late or whatever. But that's, that's what our operational theory is. And so I have that in my mind, and that's basically how I prepared to do the interview. But in the course of doing the interview, because this, this was a co-defendant case, I should say, in the course of doing the interview, what became clear is she could give a really good description of both of these guys, an excellent description. And so I'm going through and being thorough. But she started giving me threads of the idea that the one guy, and you we could tell by the physical description, because our guy was sort of tall and skinny, and the other guy wasn't, that the tall, skinny guy was you know, down the street at the point of the carjacking, maybe not like super far, but by the fire hydrant, you know, about 20 or 30 feet, and that the guy who showed her the gun had his back to him. And uh, you know, it wasn't like he was pointing the gun in her face and screaming at her. He just kept the gun low and said, listen, you need to give me your car. Mm -hmm. And so in the course of doing this and hearing these threads, I started thinking to myself, 
oh, actually, maybe we have just like a sort of DC, they called it an innocent presence defense. Like our guy just didn't know this was going on. Now, we would have had no basis based on the limited discovery we have to say like, oh yeah, that's a possibility. But when you're going into a witness interview, again, have a lens, but be flexible. Again, remember, not a cross-examination. Promise you'll have plenty of time to do that. At a bare minimum in the witness interview, uh, these are the five things to cover. You want to cover pre-event, meaning what happens before the event. Depending on who that witness is, that could be days or weeks beforehand, or it could be just that day, or it could be hours. You want to cover the actual event itself. You want to cover the post-event. For civilian witnesses, that would be um, obviously everything that happens afterwards, but uh, lots of times that focuses on their interaction with law enforcement or things they learn after. So you always want to cover those three areas, and then you want to cover internal and external. Internal being for that witness, what's kind of going on with them. Like for me, what's going on with me is my kids didn't care. I was giving this presentation, so I, the three hours of sleep I did get was laying on their floor. So that's internal for me. You might want to find out about that for a witness, right? If, especially if it's an ID issue or if it's something else having to do with their perception. Um, and external, and it could be, you know, medical condition, the big kind of obvious ones are medical conditions, sleep, uh, physical issues, psychiatric issues, stuff like that. Those are internal conditions for the witnesses. And external conditions have to do with actually kind of what's going on out in the world. So those are the, at a bare minimum in any witness interview, those are the five things you want to cover with people. You also, um, in every witness interview, want to use elimination clauses, which uh, in the particular subject matter you're talking about with them when you get to the end of sort of a natural section, just having a statement where you say to them, is there anything else you remember about that? Is that it about uh, what that person looked like? Do you remember anything else about what that person looked like? That is an elimination clause. You're closing the door, locking them in, and that is crucially important for cross-examination, because if you don't close that door and lock them in, then on cross-examination that allows them to insert any other detail uh, they wish. Avoid suggestive questions, you know, instead of was it sunny, try what was the weather like, which is pretty obvious when you're seeing it on the screen, but when you're actually having a conversation with people, especially if it's on seemingly innocuous details, it's a little hard to do, but just be conscious of that. Um, Avoid asking, do you remember, do you, do you recall questions? Questions that start with that, because that gives folks an out. They generally will be a little more likely to say, no, actually, I don't remember, I don't recall. Um, and this goes back to the slide of keeping calm and trusting no one. Have a witness defined terms. I mean, when you're talking to somebody and you know, talking to one of my colleagues or one of my friends, and they say, oh, this person was angry. I wouldn't necessarily say, what do you mean by angry? What do you mean by that? You know, I'd sort of take what they say and we have a general common understanding. But when you're talking to witnesses, you have to be very uh, certain with them. You have to be very skeptical. You have to not assume you know what they mean. So have them define things. You want to be uh, conversational insofar as it's a conversation. But one of the things that does happen and if you're just talking to your friends, you're talking to a coworker, is when you think you understand what you're saying, you might just sort of cut them off and be like, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, or you know, just sort of affirm that in some way. You need to let the witness uh, answer the question. You need to sort of have in your head uh, what that transcript looks like to make sure you're staying out of the way and being quiet and letting the witness complete their thought. And you also want to use simple language keeping it uh, pretty, uh, to, you know, pretty specific to one thing per question, and being concrete. You know, whenever I'm interviewing a witness and we're talking about distances, and this is, by the way, I know it's not always possible, but this is a plug for in-person interviewing versus telephone interviewing. When you want to talk about distances with somebody, I think one of the best ways to do it is if you're in person, have them 
describe the distance in terms of a concrete thing in the room where you are. So if you're saying, you're saying like, oh yeah, you know, the, the, the person was about 20 feet away. If you're sitting in a room, I would say, okay, you know, sir, in the US soccer jacket, I mean, if we're witness interviewing, I know what your name was, but I'd say like, okay, you know, you're sitting in the second row up as I'm facing the exit doors all the way on the uh, left-hand side of the middle section. Where in the room would you say you know, you saw the person with the gun. So you actually have something concrete to hold them to. Because I think most people are probably pretty bad and may even admit they're pretty bad at actually giving just like a number of uh, distance. Same thing with time. People are terrible with estimating time. So, you know, witnesses will say, oh, this took 20 seconds or 30 seconds or two minutes or one minute. So, um, you know, whether it's on your phone or if you're in a room with the second hand, the person said, oh yeah, I, I looked at him for, I looked at that guy's face for one minute. Say so like, okay, um, just bear with me for a second. Okay, just start now, think for a second. Do you think you saw the person's face for that long? No, it was probably like half that. Okay, well that was about 10 seconds, okay? Because the fact of the matter is, is when people are verbally describing time, they give some estimate. But when you're actually sitting and thinking about how long things are, you know, seconds uh, can seem like a really long time. So you want to be very, very concrete about estimates of time. Prepare. Preparing is very important, but this is not your time to talk. This is your time to listen. That's how you're going to really benefit your client. And then determine you know, prior to the interview, whether there's some things that might otherwise be inadmissible that you can make admissible. And we'll talk specifically about how to do that. That's what I mean by a trap. So let's talk about traps. Um, and I think probably the best way to do it is just to be really specific and give you some examples of traps I've tried to use in the past. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Like a regular trap, you can't force the thing you're trying to trap into the trap. You can just put it out there and see what happens. So um, I had a case, uh, there was a self-defense case, it was a homicide, uh, and we learned that the um, decedent had a history of really violent arrests and convictions, which in a self-defense case, right, that's like, that is gold, that is gold. The client didn't know about the specifics of those. He kind of knew the generalities, but not really enough I thought to get in the specific. So X, that's one way that it's not going to be admissible. It's not like the client, you know, is going to say like, oh yeah, yeah, I knew exactly what everything he, he uh, the decedent had been through. Again, the client knew some generalities, but not enough specifics. We also couldn't find any witnesses to support uh, general character for Bond. So there's another big X in terms of how are we going to get in this crucially important information in a self-defense case. So it turned out in that case that a lot of the uh, other state's witnesses were family members of the decedent. And um, so we tried to set up a situation where they would potentially lie about their knowledge of this. So we laid the foundation in the witness interview of how well the witness and the decedent knew each other, which wasn't too hard because they were family members. Uh, we made sure to bring out that the decedent and the family member um, knew each other during the time of these prior violent incidents and talked very specifically about you know, how often they'd see each other and what their level of interaction was during this time period. They lived together, they lived in proximity, and asked, you know, what kind of guy was the decedent? On the hope that the decedent's mother or their sister or their you know, cousin wouldn't say like, oh, he was a terrible violent person. Okay, maybe if they said that, then I, I, I would try to pursue them as being a character witness in terms of his character for violence. Um, but I sort of expected them to say like, oh, you know, he was, really, he was a really great, kind person, and they in fact said that. Um, and then I asked, you know, did, did the scene ever get in trouble for, uh, you know, get in trouble for anything? He said, oh, you know, there might have been a couple little things, but nothing big. What kind of stuff, again, they sort of soft-pedaled uh, the problems the decedent had had, asked whether he had ever done anything violent, which they said no, which again, that question by itself isn't going to make, um, 
I don't think the information we wanted admissible. But the kicker was asking, did anyone ever claim he'd ever done anything violent? And we knew from our prior investigation that the, some of the family members had uh, been at these hearings in these cases where there's the allegation of violence. And the family member said, nope, nobody ever claimed he was ever violent. He was just a, he was a nice guy and your client's a terrible person. <clears throat> So that was the ideal, right? Hopefully the witness lies. And then what we turned around and had a very, um, had a very uh, contested hearing with the prosecutor, because they obviously didn't want this information in, um, we argued that this went directly to the witness's bias. You know, this person was an eyewitness in a self-defense claim. She knew all the terrible, violent, brutal things that the scene did, and she lied about it. And she's lying about what she saw that day as well. And that in combination with actually the information about what the decedent had done was enough to persuade the judge to let a bunch of the stuff in. So, but without that, without uh, hinging this on the issue of bias and laying a trap that the family member can either fall into or not, I don't think we would have had a chance to get that information in. So here's another example. Uh, I had a client. Um, who, this was another homicide case. He claimed it was self-defense as well, and that he um, had been attacked by the decedent and that the attack was racially motivated. There was a lengthy interrogation, um, and I was interviewing the detective, uh, or the detectives, and uh, you know, this wasn't their case. They'd just done the interrogation, and so I, I got the sense throughout the course of the interview that, that you know, as police officers are wont to do, they claimed to know a lot more about the situation than they actually recalled. He claimed, uh, the lead detective, that he had reviewed the interrogation and was you know, really up to date on everything that was in it, and he understood everything that had happened. Um, and so what I asked him was, because uh, part of our theory was that the, the police didn't do any of the follow-up that would have led them to find that this was a racially motivated attack on my client. I said, you know, the decedent was white, and my client's African American. Is there any reason to think that any part of this incident was racially motivated? And of course, because the question was sort of framed in a kind of a throwaway way, he said, no, not at all. Of course, the client had said like 12 times in the interrogation, these guys were following me, calling me slurs, calling me the N-word. They were attacking me because of who I was. Now, if I had asked them, did you follow up on my client's claim that the attack was racially motivated, what they would have said was, well, no, you know, we didn't think that claim had any veracity, and here's why, and all these various things. But you, know, you set up a situation in the interview where you make a witness, or you don't make a witness, but you give a witness an opportunity to um, give you a course of cross-examination that you might not otherwise have. And this is the last example of a trap. Um, and this kind of goes back to the internet. We had, this was in the same case uh, with the cop. Uh, I know marijuana is legal, that, that's fine. But the issue was um, this particular witness, uh, he claimed um, that he, you know, marijuana to him was medicine. He had diverticulitis, I think. And it was like, you know, he just, it was like Advil or, you know, Imodium or whatever. It wasn't something uh, that was fun for him. And we found these, videos uh, on YouTube, you know, set to like death metal music where he lined up all these, uh, he lined up like five of these uh, bongs and they weren't, it wasn't actually just marijuana, it was like some kind of distilled thing and he was, you know, hitting them all in a row and then there was another video where he was um, with his teenage son, you know, just like excoriating the son for not smoking enough marijuana and like not being able to handle it and so, Arguably, this goes to his credibility, it goes to his ability to perceive. Um, the witness was very clear. He acknowledged the marijuana use. But in the witness interview, I didn't ask him, you know, so what's the deal with the, uh, you know, with the YouTube videos? I said, how do you describe your marijuana use? Light? Moderate? What would you say? It's, that's actually the example of a non-open-ended question, right, that you can sometimes use and you should use strategically. But, you know, he said, like, yeah, kind of like to moderate. And so when we got into court, you know, as evidence of uh, his lack of credibility and his um, 
perhaps diminished ability to perceive what was going on, uh, we had the witness interview and then we had the YouTube videos. And um, that was one I actually did not prevail on getting admitted. We had some other stuff on this guy. But I have to say, turning on those YouTube videos in court with the prosecutor's big speaker and that death metal playing, and they hadn't seen those videos before, was like, <laughs> it was like, it, it, was, it was just like balm to my heart. They were so, so angry. <laughs> so again, suggesting an answer that potentially makes a bad video admissible. The point of these isn't to tell you know, war stories and all this fun stuff. The point is, you don't know this stuff. You can't set these traps. You can't help get in really damaging information about the state's key witnesses unless you do this background investigation to figure this stuff up and really prepare for the witness interview. As you're doing your PDRs or your YouTube searches or whatever, and you find something that you think is good, think creatively about how can I make this admissible? How can I get this in? Because I know this is something that's going to help my case. And the other thing that I think is really important to recognize in terms of not putting pressure on yourself is you can lay the trap, but you cannot make somebody fall into the trap. You can ask the suggestive question. You know, I could say like, oh, so what's your marijuana use? How would you describe it? Light, moderate, very light. I mean, I can ask that, but if he wants to come back and say, no, it's excruciatingly heavy, <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, you know, I tried. I can't make him uh, give the answer I want. So it's important to do the work uh, but also, you also have to know when to take the pressure off yourself. So let me ask you, do folks record their uh, interviews with state witnesses or no? Yes? yes? Sometimes. sometimes. OK, that, I think that, that's the answer I kind of generally default to, which is sometimes. So we're going to talk a little bit about recording. Um, to record or not to record, an essential question. Uh, I am a big fan of recording, although you should think about it first. Don't record for defense witnesses. Do we all pretty much agree with that? OK. Uh, the state's witnesses, I generally uh, at least don't initially record. The ones I think we need to be a little careful of are those, especially you know, in like a domestic violence case or a sex case, who is a you know complainant or the state's witness who actually really wants to be helpful, but they're just doing a wretched job at doing it. They haven't quite figured out what the thing to say is. And I think this most often kind of presents itself in terms of a person who recants but doesn't account for the like myriad of physical injuries. You know, like, oh, yeah, no, they never laid a hand on me, and that's why my jaw's broken and my eyes broken. So recording that um, is, has some significant downsides, because obviously uh, you are negatively affecting the credibility of a state's witness who you want to have high credibility. So with those two caveats, defense witnesses, state's witnesses who are trying to be helpful but are doing a very poor job at it, I think recording um, is crucially important. For me, I would much rather uh, lock a witness in and have the clean impeachment of a recording. Um, I, you know, if you can avoid getting into a swearing contest between your investigator uh, and the witness, I think that's a good thing. And also, you know, if you um, don't have access to an investigator and you know the witness is willing to record and depending on the sort of practice in your particular place that can expedite things as well. Um, some people don't want to record because they uh, essentially are, are concerned about uncovering bad information and then having to turn it over to the prosecutor. They're concerned because your interview may be a lot more thorough than anything the state's going to do. And I think these are, you know, these are valid points. Um, they're also concerned that you know, you're going to reveal your defense theory, uh, and you might uncover some bad information. I think those are all valid points. I don't agree with it just for the uh, basic reason that I believe and I've found that if a witness is going to say something bad to me, they're going to say something worse to the prosecutor. And so locking that, them into whatever that initial badness they're going to say in my conversation, um, I'm not really worried about the state knowing where I'm going. I think it's. I, I think, and I think we'd all agree, there's no empirical evidence to support either one of these. But the way I practice is, I, I think it's a faulty premise that the state's only going to find out bad information from our interview, especially maybe less so in misdemeanor cases, but definitely in felony cases. If there's bad stuff from one of their witnesses, they will find it out. 
So let's talk about, um, next thing we're going to talk about is the relationship of the interview to cross. So interview and cross-examination are a little bit like an arranged marriage insofar as that you have these two things. They are like very intimately connected, but they don't necessarily have that much relation to one another. They don't know each other that well. And maybe the people who are doing the interview, and the people who are doing the cross, you know, don't know what the other one does. Like the person doing the interview may well have never done a cross-examination. And the person who is doing the cross maybe doesn't do that many interviews and, you know, doesn't really, uh, hasn't been trained or doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about that. So um, this is something that I talk to investigators about, but I also think it's just useful for us to take a step back and think about as well. These are two very different things, interview and cross. Interviews are open-ended, they're searching, they're information gathering. In general, and, you know, there are a few exceptions here and there, but in general, you're unafraid of the answers. What is important is getting the information. You want to have a theory in mind um, for the case in the witness interview, but you want to be flexible. And at a bare minimum, we talked about what you want to cover. Also in an interview, I think it's okay to be linear. You, it doesn't have to be, but that's not a bad way to go necessarily. And you use, you know, your elimination clauses. Crosses are not that. They're leading, they're one fact per question. Um, you know, unless it's a suppression hearing and it's not really a cross, you're not hopefully information gathering during your cross. You only ask the questions you know the answer to, and they're often not linear. And then they're exclusively based on the theory of the case. And so when you're thinking about what your ideal interview is as an attorney, you know, it lets you know what you can't ask and what you can. And it's open-ended so you know what the witness is going to say. But by the same token, it also locks that witness down. Allows you to hold them to a particular version. So um, what I'm going to do now is... Uh, I sort of jokingly called it a one-man play. It's not really that, but we're going to go through a witness interview and then a potential cross based on that witness interview and kind of see how that plays out. Okay, so uh, this is the witness interview. It's a shooting case. The defense is misidentification. The allegation is that your client shot a bouncer at a nightclub. And so the interview... Uh, having to do with the description, said, have you ever, had you ever seen the guy before? And this is asking the bouncer. Okay. So the investigator says, have you ever seen the guy before? No. Can you describe him? Yeah. Uh, they both looked uh, African or African-American, dark skin, dreadlocks, both relatively short and skinny. Do you have any idea how tall? I'm not sure. I'm not a good estimator of height, but he's not six feet. Do you remember anything about what he was wearing? Uh, it's been a long time, I'm not sure, but I think uh, I told the police after I was shot he was wearing a blue shirt. So that's not a bad interview. I mean, it you know, gets you the basic idea. It's Miss ID. It has description. It's not bad at all. Uh, so here's what the cross might look like. So let's talk about uh, what you say the person who shot you looked like. He was African-American? Yeah, yeah, he was African-American. He was dark-skinned. Oh, I just meant he was white. I just meant he was not white, you know, like he was African-American. He actually had the same complexion as your client. Okay, all right, well, that's fine. I'm going to impeach you. I'll go over and get my back things up, go get my witness interview transcript. i get this marked, show it to the prosecutor. Now, do you remember talking to my investigator back in December? Yeah, yeah, I do. And, you know, one of the things the investigator asked you uh, was to talk about what the person who shot you looked like. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And well, the investigator asked you, can you describe him? And you remember that? Yeah. And you told the investigator, uh, the people who shot you, they both looked at African, African-American, dark skin. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what it says. But like I, I told you, I mean, he didn't ask me what his complexion was. He, I just meant dark skin, like not white. All right. Okay, I'm going to move on to my next question. That didn't go ideally. Uh, the person who you claim shot you had dreadlocks. Yeah. Long braided hair. 
Uh, no, no, not, not really, not really. I, I, I mean, I guess I'm not talking like Bob Marley dreadlocks. I just meant like kind of like medium twists, you know, like your client. <laughs> <sighs> All right, well, you remember talking to the investigator, right? And they sat down and they asked you if you had any questions about the questions that they had and they were trying to be uh, true and accurate and complete. Oh, yeah, definitely, most definitely. And you described the person uh, who shot you as having dreadlocks. Yeah, but I mean, he didn't ask me what I meant. Uh, I mean, like, you know, I'm not like a hair expert. It's a dreadlocks. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, it's like twists. It's not like, not like not twisted. <sighs> All right. This is not going ideally. <sighs> Let's see, do I have any other questions? The person who shot you had on a blue shirt. And at this point, maybe we could talk about strategy and cross-examination, whether at this point, maybe you want to like take a second and retool some of your questions. But just go with me on this. Uh, had on a blue shirt. Well, most definitely. There was blue on that shirt. But I'm not saying like it was an all blue shirt. It was kind of like, you know how, I mean, you could say that that shirt you're wearing is a blue shirt. It has blue, but it also has white and black and stripes. But it definitely had blue on it. We know by this point you remember talking to my investigator, right? And they asked you what he was wearing. I'm not sure. I think I told the police after I was shot he was wearing a blue shirt. That's what you told my investigator. Yeah, I said, I, I think. I'm not sure. I'd just been shot. <laughs> Did you hear that part? And I'm just saying, yeah, it had definitely had some blue on it, but it wasn't like an all blue shirt like that guy's. That's all I'm saying. All right, so I'm 0 for 4 at this point. <laughs> and again, from a strategic position, maybe you just want to do something else. But if you're feeling game and perhaps foolish, and that is all you remember about the person who shot you? That's all you remember about what they look like. Uh, no, he had a scar on his cheek, just like your client. You talked to my investigator. He, he asked you to describe the person who you say shot you. Nowhere in this interview that is 30 pages long did you ever say that. That's true. And you can do your whole impeachment bio mission which I think is useful, but I think sometimes we overemphasize the importance of impeachment by omission. But ultimately, what the witness may turn and say to you is, uh, yeah, but you never asked. So uh, you sit down, your client looks at you like, what are you doing? <laughs> I thought you said you were a good lawyer. <laughs> So let's talk about how to improve. Because I mean, I think, the, I think the important thing is, well, there are two important things. Um, one is that when you look at that witness interview when we started out, it's actually like not a bad witness interview. It's not glaringly terrible. But there's not necessarily the relationship between your cross-examination and your witness interview that you might want to have to really make it as seamless as possible. So um, what could have been, aside from more detail, up there. What could have been improved, do you think, in the witness interview? And I either pick on somebody, sir, you're wearing a shirt. Can you answer the question? <laughs> All these things, more detail, you know, we're talking about, and it's not just specifically the thing this fictional witness uh, fictionally dinged me on, but, you know, the idea of not, uh, you know, being skeptical about everything, keeping calm and trusting no one. So when you person says an African-American, don't assume you know what they meant. Or when they said dark skin, don't assume uh, that when they say dark skin, that means the same thing to them as it does to you. Ask them, especially in a Miss ID case, right, about skin tone and hairstyle with specificity. You know, dreadlocks, can you describe what you mean by that? Clothes. Be skeptical. Don't assume that you know what people mean. And, you know, I the saving grace, I think, a lot of times, if you can't remember every single uh, specific question you need, put that elimination clause in about the description. Is there anything else you remember about that person's description? 
Nope, that was it. Because that at least gives you something when they try to spin you. All right, uh, let's do one more um, one act <coughs> play. So here's, again, the witness interview, same case. Uh, question by the investigator. So the guy who shot you came back. Uh, what was he doing? He walked over, uh, he walked towards us over to a car and was sitting on the opposite side of the street. Pretty much right across? Yeah, right across. And uh, he went and sat on the hood of the car facing us with his legs in the street, just facing us with his hands under his pants. What did you do when you saw him? I just stayed there. We were just uh, standing there not saying a word. How long was the guy sitting on the car for? About two minutes, and then he walked over to me. So again, that's the interview. It's not bad. I mean, you know, it covers, covers kind of the basics of what you need. And maybe in the interim of this witness pummeling me on cross, I've retooled and I've gotten a little bit more conservative. So let's talk about what happened when the guy came back. He didn't come right up to you. He wasn't on the same side of the street. He's on the other side of the street. And you didn't call the police. You didn't run. And I didn't make any points in my cross-examination particularly. But that's, you know, the safe conservative cross based on what you have in that witness interview. What you would probably want to do in that situation is, you know, do that time trick that, you know, we did a, a little bit ago. You said two minutes, okay, you know, I'm going to start the clock now. At, uh, uh, it's at 50 seconds, and then, you know, you do it for 10 seconds and see how long the person says it is. Distance. Rel uh, relative to the room you're in. How the person's facing, you know, are they oriented right towards you or, you know, are they kind of sitting side on the car? How much of their face was facing you, you know, description of the car, how the person's hand was down their pants. The implication was, you know, he had a gun or was motioning towards a gun, but you would want more detail about that and also what the uh, person, you know, what the complainant was thinking and what he was looking at. Other distractions, noises, you know, this is outside a club, what else is going on? Because he's a bouncer. Are there other IDs he's checking? Are there um, <clears throat> fights that are going on? Is he getting yelled at by his boss? Obviously the lighting, all these things. You know, you'd want to flesh um, this out much more. Maybe even ask for another description of what the person looked like across the street. Uh, if he was concerned why he didn't go get the police, what the complainant was doing uh, when the person who shot him was walking towards him, how he was feeling, what he was thinking. And again, this stuff here, right, you know, if you're going for a misidentification case, um, especially if it's potentially a cross-racial ID, you know, this is a, falls into the category of know the what, right? You know, what are the things that are relevant to this subject matter in terms of misidentification that you would want to be asking somebody about. And you know, stress level and weapons focus and all that kind of stuff. And again, like I, I said when we were talking about that before, I sort of have, at this point, have a glib knowledge of that sort of thing. But the last cross-racial identification case I did was probably five years ago. So if I were doing this case, I would want somebody who could really educate me on it before I started doing the witness. What was the witness focusing on? And that, um, aside from taking a couple minutes, if people want to uh, brainstorm one of the hypos, um, was what I want to talk to you about. Does anybody have any questions before we just quickly brainstorm this, this third one? OK. So this was one of the hypos in, I think, your materials for yesterday. This is the one with Mr. King, who is alleged to get in a bar fight and punch somebody in the eye. Um, do folks remember the facts of that, or do you want me to read that? Yes, no? Do you remember the facts? OK. So according to um, client's girlfriend, there was a fight uh, began when Mr. King made disparaging remarks about the complainant's girlfriend. The complainant then took a swing at Mr. King, who backed off. Mr. King attempted to leave the bar, but the complainant blocked away and then threw a punch at your client. Uh, Mr. King threw up his arms to block the punch and then connected, uh, giving him a black eye. The complainant left the bar uh, and called the police. When the police arrived, Mr. King was in custody. Police reports say that Mr. King started the fight by making disparaging comments towards the complainant. The complainant denies ever throwing a punch. That information that the complainant started it was from your client's girlfriend. 
Um, he called the police after he left the bar, and he had an obvious black eye in the photo. So, and again, this is brainstorming, so that's going to mean you guys are going to do most of the talking. What is your legal defense, you think? Depends on what your client says. Okay. Okay. Well, let's say what your client says is more or less consistent with what the girlfriend says. Self-defense. Okay. So self-defense, right? That's pretty, pretty obvious. Um, what do we want to do in terms of investigation in this case? What if the bartender says, I, you know, I don't, I mean, there are a lot of people. I don't know who, I don't know who is there. And these are the only witnesses the police uh, reference. How can we go about trying to security footage. security footage? That's good. And right, this goes back into the knowing the where, right? Ideally, you get out to the scene, you talk to the bartender. If this is a place that's busy, um, you probably want to do it ASAP because you know who knows how often this kind of stuff happens. One of the things sometimes in you know a case like this where you have a bar is um, seeing if they'll give you or subpoenaing. Uh, the receipts from that night. Some people are going to pay with cash and you don't know who they are. Some people are going to pay with credit cards and you might be able to figure out who they are. So uh, if you know the time frame, going out there and trying to get that stuff. Also, um, and it depends on what kind of bar it is, but if it's one that's a little more kind of professional on the HR side of things, sometimes if there's a fight or something, they have to write up a little like bar incident report so they don't get sued, right? What else could we be doing? What else should we be doing? So calls for service is one thing that's really, uh, I assume it's everywhere in the state, but I know we have it here in King County. You can find out um, what the calls for service to a particular address are. So that means like whenever 911 is called. So that could be really useful. Uh, you might be able to do a, a PDR. I'm not, I think you might be able to do a PDR based on the address. So you might be able to find stuff out that way. Now, if you're in a, you know, a misdemeanor jury trial and you have like no time between jury selection and the start of the case, you might not be able to do you know, social media investigation on your potential jurors. But if you have a bigger case where you know, there is time that's being taken in the jury selection process, that's absolutely right. And you know, not everybody can necessarily hire that company, but you can have your investigator do you know, the cursory kind of background internet, you know, Google, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram, those kinds of things, and actually find out some pretty important stuff about jurors. And I know, you know Granted, it's on a much different scale, but in the Tsarnaev case, they were finding out, a, and I think on the uh, Aaron Hernandez case, they were finding out a whole bunch of stuff about the jurors, you know, in trial, before trial about them. So I, I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. And um, whenever you have time in jury selection, investigation on your potential jurors is, is really, really critical.